folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2012 with another Watchman video broadcast. You know, every time I come in here and get ready to record one of these Watchman broadcasts, I uh, always get, get everything ready here. Got my former friends here ready and available. And I have my longtime friend, this Bible here. And I always try to pray before I start talking. Hope, pray that God will just bless something that I do or bless His Word as it goes forth. <clears throat> when I got done praying just now, I noticed that my Bible was open to Ecclesiastes. I just came in, opened it, set it down. You know, it's a table prop. Uh, more than that, though. And where it fell open was um, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And I had this verse underlined, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. I'm going to be dealing with a very, very serious matter today. And it does matter. It matters to me and it, hopefully it matters to you. And I want you to draw a conclusion by the time I'm done giving all of the information, all of the verses that I have for you. I'm going to try to lead you to a conclusion. My hope and prayer is that it's the right conclusion, the correct conclusion, not according, not according to me and not according to you or not according to any other man, but according to the Word of God. I want to draw you to a conclusion on what you believe about the Bible. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, and you should, and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Why were you born? Why are you here? Why are you living in the day that you're living in right now? Why are you listening to this? Could be that you desire to know truth. It could be that somebody just gave you this in a DVD or someone said, hey, you need to watch this YouTube video or whatever. But our responsibility is not to play baseball, it's not to have sports, it's not to have mega churches or anything like that. Our entire responsibility is summed up this way, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. One of the things that I absolutely know is that, number one, I am going to stand before God one of these days and give an account for the things that I have done. And the secret things, that means the things that I have thought or the things that I think in my mind. And those things will be brought into judgment one of these days. And so I approach this subject with fear and trembling, not just of the hope that you will receive what I'm going to give you today, but the idea that I know that every word that I speak today, not only is it being recorded now for everybody to watch, but it's being recorded in heaven, and God will bring these words either for me or against me one of these days. So I have to make sure that what I say comes from and is based upon what I know to be the entire truth of the Word of God. And so we're going to be dealing with this issue of, I have, I have right here, I have the King James Bible. And then over here I have uh, something that I got in college. This is the Greek New Testament. Actually, I have a, another one, the, uh, the interlinear Greek New Testament. See, because when I was in college, I kind of cheated a little bit. Okay, um, Let's see here. I have the Living Bible. I have something called the book. I have the, uh, let's see here, which one is this one? The New Revised Standard Version. I have the New King James Version. I have the N New International Version. They're all different versions, different translations of the Bible. And a lot of people want to say, well, they all say the same thing. They just kind of use a little different language. Um, we're going to show you that they don't all say the same thing. There's a major differences between these and this. In fact, there's even major differences between this one and this one. These don't, they don't agree. They don't get along very well. And so we're going to deal with this issue. Now, you can either have a closed mind because you were taught as I was taught in a seminary or at a Bible college or from a pulpit. You were taught that there is no such thing as a perfect Bible. You were taught that. That's what I was taught. And I, and I want you to just kind of not think of, ah, uh, he's King James only. That's a cult. 
I don't want you to think that way because really that's not what I'm going to teach you. I'm going to try to teach you that, number one, I believe in the inspiration of God, the plenary verbal inspiration of God, that God, when Jeremiah was writing, God said every word that Jeremiah wrote down. Those are the words of God. I'm going to show you, show you that from the scripture. Number two, I believe in the preservation of the word of God, and I'm going to show you that from the scriptures. I'm going to show you how that works, how God preserved his word from the scriptures. Then I'm going to show you something that I really want you to understand this, that I'm getting this from the word of God. I'm getting this from the Bible. Is that God not only inspired his word, he not only preserved his word, but God translated his word into the language that you and I use right now. He, he's the one that did that. And if you're going to have problem getting over that hump, I want you to at least give me about an hour or two of your time because I'm going to try to explain this. At least, it, here's, what I, here's what I want you to I just want you to at least hear me out on this. And if you find that scripturally, not, not what the, uh, not what the uh, manuscript evidence says, not what uh, Dr. So-and-so says, and not what you've heard in Bible college and seminary, because I heard it all, and I used to believe it. But not based upon what you already think, but based upon, number one, do you fear God and do you fear his commandments? Do, are you, do you believe that's what, that what is written in this book is correct and is right? Do you believe that? And so I'm just going to ask you to question. Uh, we're going to deal with which, which Bible should we, should we believe, which one should we use, and I'm going to let you be the judge. I'm going to let you judge yourself on this issue, and knowing now, knowing that both you and I are going to stand together, probably side by side, in front of the same judge, the same God, and he's going to use a standard. He's going to use a, a perfect measure to judge both you and I. He's not going to judge you differently than me or me differently than you. We're going to be judged the, the exact same way. How is God going to do that is the question. And I want you to understand where my heart is today. It's not to make you followers of Mike Hoggard. It's not to make you part of the King James only crowd. It's to get you to understand and believe that you can have, that your hope and that you can still believe in the Bible that God spoke, preserved, and God speaks this way to us in the language that you and I speak. And I'm going to show you that from the Bible. So let's, uh, in fact, here's what I want you to do. Psalm 34, verse 8. The Bible says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. And then Psalm 1830, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust him. And so here's what I'm wanting you to do according to the scripture. I want you to taste this. How do you know you're not going to like it? How do you know you are going to like it? But I want you to taste this idea. I want you to hear me out on this. And I want you to try this in your mind based upon all the evidence that you think you have. I want you to taste and see whether or not what I'm going to show you today is good. And I'm going to let you be the judge on this issue. And here's how we're going to start. We're going to, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. We're going to find out how we ended up with, with these. Okay? We're going to find out how we ended up with this uh, 1611 Bible, how we ended up with, with all of these, including the, uh, the Greek text and so on, how, how we did this. And we're going to follow this from the scriptures. We're going to let the scriptures be our guide. Um, and the question arises, how can I hear from God? Do I hear God in an audible voice? Do I have dreams and visions? Uh, do, I, uh, do I believe that I can hear God from the pages of the Bible? And I'm going to show you the standard that God himself set down for mankind. Because remember, it's that standard that you and I are going to be judged by is the standard that God himself sets down, He's, and he sets it down, I believe, according to his word. Let's go to Exodus chapter 17, verse 14. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out of the remembrance of Amalek, 
from under heaven. I want you to notice that God told Moses to write this for a memorial in a book. And you and I both know, we've played that game before where uh, I'm going to say something to you and then you turn around to say it and by the time it gets to the 20th person, the 20th person repeats it. It's not the same as what I said it originally. And, and, and here we are, we're dealing with what was original. Let's say that God told me something. Let's say that I'm Moses and God specifically told me words to say to everybody. Well, you know as well as I do that by the time they get around to this person here, orally, that the words that this person has is not the same words as the original words that were given. And so what God plainly told to Moses was, write this for a memorial in a book. And so we have the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that the Bible says that Moses wrote these things down, and he wrote them down in a book. Deuteronomy 17, verse 18, And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. And this was the law concerning Israel. God says, you get into the land. I know for a fact you're going to want a king because I can see into your future. And when he becomes king, I want him to sit down and I want him to write out a copy of this law in a book. And I want him to rule according to not what he heard, not what was passed down by oral tradition, not what grandfather told him how the old days used to be. He's going to rule according to what is in the book. It's been written down and preserved that way. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 24, And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished. In other words, this verse is telling us that Moses wrote down all the words of God, the law, he wrote it down in a book until they were, in other words, he wrote the very last thing that God said. He wrote it all down. And so this is where we get into the plenary verbal inspiration of the Bible, that God took all the words of the law of God and he wrote them down and they were finished. It was over with. It was done. God, when, when God stopped speaking, that's when Moses stopped writing. And that's what we believe from the scriptures. First Samuel 10 verse 25. Then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house, the manner of the kingdom, how God rules, how God reigns, what God's word is, what God's law is, what are his expectations of us. And what you and I can expect from God, these things were written down by Samuel in a book. So we have Moses being a part, of an, a part of the authorship of the Bible. We have Samuel writing down the things of God. Job chapter 19, verse 23, Job said, Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. Well, they were, Job. They were printed in a book. Every word that Job said concerning this ordeal that he went through, somehow, some way, maybe Job wrote them down or somebody else did, but they wrote these things down to memorialize, you know, if you, uh, if you have a situation where the police get involved in something, let's say if it's a traffic ticket or an accident or anything like that, the police show up, the first thing they do is they pull out a pad and a pen. And what do they start doing? They start memorializing the events as they're told by the witnesses. Why? Because lawyers and judges, people in a courtroom know that witness testimony after the event, let's say a day or a week or a month or a year, let's say a lawsuit is, is going on here, and they know that people tend to forget or they tend to change things in their mind to suit some other idea that they have. But the police officer shows up, and he immediately starts taking down names, license number, phone numbers, and he draws out a map of what car was doing what, he draws out the weather, he, he memorializes everything that he can in a book. And those generally are accepted as fact in a court of law. And so Job is, and here we have Moses, we have Samuel saying the exact same thing. They were given to us by God, and as soon as they were given to us, we memorialized them. We wrote them down in a book, paper and ink. 
last an awfully long time. It lasts longer than our thoughts do. And so that is the method that God used. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 8. Now go, write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. In this verse here, God is clearly saying to Isaiah, Isaiah, the words that I gave you, write them down right now. Note it in a book. Write it on a table or a tablet. Write it down so that it will be for a time to come forever and ever. God not only wanted it written down for that time right then, which is the part of the doctrine that we believe called the inspiration of the Bible or the inspiration of the Word of God in the original, what we call the manuscripts. In other words, the scroll or the vellum, and I'll explain that in a minute, the scroll that, that Isaiah had before him, he's writing, of course, I'm, he's writing from, uh, from right to left because he's in Hebrew, and he's writing these things down on the table or on the, on the notebook or the pad or whatever he's got. He's writing these words down as God is giving to them, them to him, And it's intended by God himself. It's intended that these words that Isaiah wrote down would be for ever and ever. That was God's intention all along. Is that the words that he wrote down, not only then were the inspired word of God, the God-breathed words, but God had always intended to preserve these words forever and ever. Jeremiah 30, verse 2. Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. God's commandment is that they are to be written down in a book. Why? So that, number one, when people read it, they say, well, and when everybody reads this book, they're reading the exact same words. I mean, you and I both know if we go hunting or we go fishing or we go shopping or whatever, if we have a vacation or some of it happens, we all know that every time we tell the story, we tell it just a little bit differently than we did before. But God, God's not complacent with that. He's not happy with that. He wants to make sure that everybody that reads his book is reading the exact same thing. Ezra chapter 7, verse 6. This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And let me stop right here. We have Ezra. We have Moses. We have Samuel. Uh, we have David, who wrote down Psalms. Uh, we have other writers. We have Solomon, who was a part writer of the Bible. We have Isaiah. We have Jeremiah. We have the prophets. And then we have a guy by the name of Ezra, who came after all of these men. He is part of the... Um, part of the ones who, who came back from Babylon. And Ezra had with him, because God had even decided to preserve the books that were written, he decided to preserve them even when the Israelites were in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. And so Ezra comes back from Babylon, and the Bible describes him as a ready scribe in the law of Moses. The word scribe. It's an easy word. If you go to the doctor and he gives you, he says, you're going to have to take some medicine. I'm going to write down a prescription. That word script, a prescription or whatever, uh, basically means to scratch something down. If you've ever seen a doctor, they, they scratch it all out. Okay, But it basically means to write it down. And that's what, that's what Ezra's job was. He was a ready scribe in the law of Moses. He was faithful to God. We see Ezra standing up behind a pulpit of wood to preach and to teach the Word of God. And there was so much power in the Word of God that had been preserved by the hands of Ezra. There's so much power in it. The Bible says that when Ezra stood up and he opened the book, the people all stood up in reverence to the book and they said, Amen, Amen. And I believe in that kind of reverence to the Word of God. I don't just think I have the dictations of crazy men or their, their fanciful stories or their mythologies or whatever. I don't think I have that here. I think I have in my hand, in this table in front of me, the very words of God. And I stand in awe and reverence to what is written down in this book. And so God is using these men. As he gives them his words, he is using these men 
to write these things down so that they could be for a time to come forever and forever. And you need to think about, let's, let's tell another story from the Bible. We have Josiah. Josiah. In Josiah's days, there was no book to be found. There was no law. And so Josiah wanted to serve God. He wanted to do what was right. He didn't have a way to do it. Until they went through the temple and they found the book. God had preserved his words in a book so that when Josiah read them, he was afraid. He had the fear of God in him because he wanted to keep the commandments of God. And when the book was read to him, he rent his clothes and he wept and he begged God, God, I understand my fathers have been wicked and I understand that you said that you were going to judge us. Lord, please don't do this in my lifetime. Give us another chance. And God hearkened to the words of Josiah, the prayer of Josiah, because Josiah hearkened, he listened to, he gave attention to, and he obeyed the words of his God that were written in that book. Josiah had reverence for the word of God. That was the Old Testament. Now we get into the New Testament time. We have a guy by the name of Luke. The Bible says in Luke chapter 1, this is the beginning of Luke's gospel. And he's writing to someone named Theophilus because Theophilus wants to hear the story of Jesus. Tell me the story of Jesus. And so here's what Luke said. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. In other words, Theophilus had heard stories. He had heard things about Jesus, and he believed them from the mouths of other people. But what Luke was saying here was, he said, I thought it good to write it down for you so that you would know the certainty of the things that you have already heard. And so what did Luke do? He wrote them down. He memorialized them in a book. And I want you to think about this. Let's say that all the things that Jesus did 2,000 years ago had never been written down, but we were counting upon faithful men to tell us the truth for 2,000 years. Well, I tell you what, having a story being passed around for 2,000 years, things definitely would get lost. We wouldn't really know if we were telling the truth or not. But we know that we have these writings that go almost all the way back to the time of Luke, almost all the way back to the time of Isaiah, and we know that the things that they wrote down, God had them write down for a memorial so that every generation would know the words of God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, the Bible says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Luke wrote them down. Isaiah wrote them down. Jeremiah wrote them down. Ezra made sure that everything was written down and compiled correctly. That was one of his responsibilities. And that everything was faithfully preserved. That was another responsibility of the scribe was to make sure that if he was making a copy of a manuscript, it was his responsibility as a ready scribe in the, in the law of the Lord to make sure that what this new copy says is exactly what the old copy said, you know, why, you know why they had to copy them? Because they knew that this old copy wasn't getting any younger. It's kind of like us. We don't get any younger every day. We get a little bit worn out. We get rough around the edges and things end up not working anymore. And so he knows and understands that there needs to be a brand new, fresh copy of the original. And God used him to preserve his word. And so now we, in the New Testament day, we have the same thing. Only in this case, Luke is not really a, a ready scribe. He's not a Levite priest. But he does fall in the category of what we call the priesthood of the believer. You see, in the New Testament, now you and I who are born again, we are all kings and priests before the Lord. And so God just used a plain man. According to the Bible, he was a Gentile. According to the Bible, he was, he was a physician. He was a doctor. And yet God used him to just write all of these things down for a memorial in a book. John, the same thing. He was just a guy that God called. He believed God. 
and what God told him, John wrote them down. Why? These things have I written to you that you may know that you have eternal life. Where does our knowledge of eternal life come from? Does it come from, well, the priest told me that I was going to heaven after I went to purgatory for a while. Or the preacher said I was saved. How, how confident are we? Because don't preachers make mistakes? Don't some preachers tell lies? Don't some preachers fall into unfaithfulness? Yeah. So if a preacher tells us this, how true is it? And yet if we read it, because it's been written down, we know that we can believe it. Revelation chapter 1, here's John again. And he sees Jesus face to face. Jesus says, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. So Jesus himself is saying, everything that you see, John, I don't want you to just try to remember it because we know historically that John was on the tail end of his life. He received the book of Revelation and the visions of Revelation not too long before he died. He was upwards in somewhere around 92, 93, some say even 96 years old when Jesus showed up to him. So the clock is ticking on John's life. And Jesus said, John, the things that I'm going to show you, just write them down. Just write them down. And I will make sure that these words are kept and preserved so that everybody will know what's going to happen in the end of time. Everybody can see heaven like you saw it because you described what you saw and you wrote it down inside of a book. And so we have Old Testament and New Testament people that God used to write these things down, the words of God. And so in Hebrews chapter 1, the Bible says, God, who at sundry times and in divers or diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And so we understand now that God spoke in the Old Testament through the prophets, and the prophets wrote everything down. We also now know that in these last days, God speaks to us through his son in the New Testament, and these men wrote these things down so that you and I would know exactly how God speaks because it's written down in his word. Now, here's what also the Bible says, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture. And let me let me stop right here. Let me let me let me give you an idea of what the word prophecy means. Some people say, well, prophecy is that's telling the future. Well, it kind of does have something to do with that. But if you have you ever read in the scripture where like God was saying to Ezekiel, son of man, prophesy unto these pro people, prophesy and say unto them. You'll see that like over and over and over in the scriptures. The word prophecy means to speak that which God has given you. That's what prophesying is. And so knowing this first, that no prophecy, which is just the words of the Lord being made plain, prophecy of the scripture. Here again, let's stop right here. Notice that since Ezra was already scribe, meaning he wrote them down, that all the prophets, all the apostles, uh, the words of Jesus himself given to us in the gospels, they are what we call the scripture. They are the words, not just floating around in air from one person to another, they are the words written down on paper. No prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so here we have these men. We have Moses. We have Solomon. We have David. We have Isaiah, Jeremiah. We have these men. We even have Enoch. The Bible talks about in uh, Genesis chapter 5, we have his words recorded for us all the way down in the book of Jude. God made sure that the words that Enoch spoke some you know, 4,000 years before, 3,000 years before, have been written down in, and noted in the book. Jude wrote them down because they were given to him by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And so these prophecies came not by the will of men, 
but holy men of God spake and they wrote down as they were moved, inspired by the Holy Ghost. And so here we have the doctrine that says that when these men wrote this down, they wrote down every word that God said. Now, some people, some, some scholars believe that like Paul, he was just, he had these thoughts, God gave him these thoughts, and then Paul said, you know, I think we should probably write it like this. Tertullius, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's pretty good. And so they think that Paul wrote down the thoughts of God. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that they wrote the very words down on that papyrus or vellum or whatever it is. And so we have those originals being written down. Now here's, here's one of the problems that we have. We don't have any, any of the original papyrus or vellum that Moses, Isaiah, David, uh, Jeremiah, Luke, Paul, Jude, John. The original, like this piece of paper right here that I just made some marks on, okay, that doesn't exist anymore. Doesn't exist. And so the, the doctrinal statement given by most colleges, churches, ministries, pastors, whatever, they say that we believe the Bible to be the inspired word of God in these, in these original manuscripts. There's a problem with that. These don't, they're not around, they don't exist anywhere. I don't know why. Maybe some guy's got them locked up in a footlocker somewhere. I don't know. But I'm just saying that as far as we know, these original papyrus, scrolls, things like that, they don't exist anywhere in the earth, any place. So if God wanted his words to be preserved, and remember what he told Isaiah, write it down for, you know, for a memorial in a book that it could be for the time to come and then forever and ever. So you have to understand that God would have had a plan. God himself, who was in charge of giving the words to Isaiah and Jeremiah and Luke, then would have had a plan to make sure that those words were kept around. I'm going to show you from the Bible God's plan for keeping those words around. We talked about, we talked about Ezra. Ezra, the Bible says, was a ready scribe before the Lord. And Ezra's responsibility was to make sure that the books that he had were preserved. We're talking about the transmission of texts. We're talking about um, God using the Old Testament scribes. You remember Jesus dealt with some of these people, the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes, pretty much all they did they were the copying machine of the Old Testament. Now, back before they had copy machines and mimeograph machines and even typesetting, you had men who did nothing in life but sit and go, Aleph, Daleth, and they would write down one letter at a time, one word at a time, so that the old manuscript, if it passed away, we have a complete copy of what used to be. Ezra was one of those scribes. He was an example of that. And, and by the way, Ezra was faithful to God. You know what Ezra did? When Ezra had this old book in his hand, he believed in his heart that it was the very words of God and that that book was sacred so that by the time he gets around to preaching and teaching the law to the people after they had been in exile for 70 years and been eating Babylonian food and, and seeing Babylonian TV shows and Babylonian religious guys, that at the end of 70 years, Ezra comes back and because God used him to faithfully preserve the words of the book, Ezra stands up with the scroll, opens the scroll, and everybody stands up and says, this is the word of God. We give reverence and respect to the word of God. They respected that book. They feared that book. And they stood up and they said, amen. Before even the book was written, they said, we know that that's the word of God. Before it was read, they said, we know that that's the word of God. 
and we respect it, we reverence it. And every, everything that we now hear from that, we already say amen to, which means let it be established, let it be so. We agree with what we're about to hear we, because we already know that this is the words of God. So that's how it was done in the Old Testament. Now in the New Testament, um, the scribes, the Pharisees, as of about A.D. 70, uh, God kicked them all out of Jerusalem. So they're scattered all over the place, and here we find a bunch of people without a job. Okay, and so, But God is giving his New Testament. He's telling Luke, write this down. He's telling Paul, write these things down. Write these letters down. Pass them to the churches. And uh, so, and the scribes, the Jewish scribes, they're going, uh, we don't believe in that Jesus, and we certainly don't believe in that New Testament stuff. So they didn't write it down. How did God do this? He did it through what we call the, the priesthood of the believer. It was the believer, the church member, who was helping to write these things down. Let me show you a verse in Colossians chapter 4, verse 16. This is the Apostle Paul to the Colossians, and he says, And when this epistle is read among you, Cause it to be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So we know that Paul wrote something to the Laodicean church. We don't know what it was. No, it's not some lost book of the Bible. But anyway, that Paul, when Paul wrote this letter to the Colossian churches, he said, you need to send a copy over to the Laodicean church. They need to hear this too. This is for them. And so we understand, as Christians, that when Paul wrote to the Romans, he wasn't just writing to the Romans. He was writing to us. It was intended that what Paul wrote here was spread to all the churches. 1 Corinthians, likewise. Colossians, likewise. Philippians, likewise. Um, when Jesus gave John the letters to the churches and the vision of Revelation, he said, you send it to all these churches. Every church gets the same copy. And so when John is writing this down, there is an understanding that he has to copy these words down accurately so that all of the other churches can have what the other churches had. And so here we have an example, Colossians. What, I'm, what you write down, Paul, and the words that I'm giving you, you send it to the Colossians and you tell the Colossians to take this and make a copy of it and send it to the church at Laodicea so that they can have the exact same verses. They can have the exact same words. And so we know, according to Scripture, that these, these early letters, these gospel accounts, where were sent out to people, and those people made copies of them. No, not typesetting, not mimeograph. There was somebody, a learned person in that church or in those churches, who were writing these things down. They were doing it faithfully. This is the priesthood of the believer, the common man, the fisherman, the tent makers. Okay? These were common people who had enough education to be able to write these letters and these words down in Greek. And they're in Greek, so I have to write this way now. So they're writing these things down, and these letters are being forwarded to other churches. And these churches, these bishops are reading these letters, and they're unscrolling them, and they're reading them, and they scroll them back. And then they unscroll them again, and they read them, and they scroll them back. So here, here's what happens. Okay, I'm going to show you this. This is my Bible. Okay, I've had this since I was 16 years old, and this page here is it's ripped. And if I'm not real careful, oh no, it's got a little coffee stain here too. Okay, I have several. Of, I have two Bibles that I use all the time. This one's got rips and tears in it. My other one uh, that I use behind the pulpit, it's got a section of revelation that is removable. You take it out and put it back in, take it out and put it back in. Uh, I always try to keep it in, but I know that someday I may lose that and not have it there. Okay, But don't worry. I can go get another copy of that same Bible. But you understand that the more you use a Bible, the more worn out it gets. It gets frazzled and then it just gets used and worn. After a hundred, You ever seen a hundred year old Bible? And these things are huge, but boy, they come apart. The paper gets brittle, and it comes apart very easily. And every one of these churches that it's being sent to, it, they believe that this is the very words of God. And so they, they handle them carefully. And they say that, man, Paul wrote this. I better make sure that what Paul said gets written down 
perfectly. And so they were copied into the thousands all over the place. They were copied and copied and transmitted and read and unscrolled and rolled back and unrolled and rolled back again. And here, read this. And here, you read this. And let me copy this down and give it to this church over here so that they can have the same thing that you and I have. And they believed that they were the words of God. Now, at, at, at the time of John, God finished these words that he said, okay? And they were a complete record of everything that you and I are supposed to believe. They were a complete record. Let me give you an example of that. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture, let me, let me just stop right here. All the, the, the scribes' words... All the things written down, the complete form of the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I'll show you something out of Revelation here in a minute. All of those words were faithfully and accurately written down on paper. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Let me stop right here. I, I, I heard in Bible college because they teach you a lot of... Uh, teach you a lot of Greek, okay? And they say, now, the original Greek here of this is theopneustos, which means theos is God and neustos is like pneuma or pneumatic tools or pneumonia. It's air, it's breath. So they said, the original says God breathed. And I went, ooh, the original says God breathed. Wow, it doesn't say that there. It doesn't say God. Well, I found out that, see, I just decided to learn English better. Inspiration, the word spira, that little part of that word inspiration there, you know what it means? <sighs> Respiration. You know what inspiration is? It's <sighs> taking inward, respiring, take, sending out. All scripture is given by the breath, the inspiration of God. See, it says it right there in English. It is an accurate way of saying exactly what was in the original Greek. All scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So here's what, here's what Paul, the, the doctrine now that Paul is laying down, is that all of these scriptures that we have, all of these books that we have, we collect them together, we call it the Bible. He said it is completely and totally sufficient for everything that you and I need to believe. Now, if somebody comes along a thousand years, two thousand years later, and says, but wait a minute, I have a revelation from God. I think God is kind of like this. And Paul's saying, now, if this guy says this, and it's not in the scripture, then he's wrong, and the scripture's right. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, so that if I think of something, and I think, well, maybe God's like this, and I'm reading here, and I'm going, oh, no, no. God said he's like this. I have to believe this, and I can't even believe myself for whatever doctrine or idea I came up from. So, for correction, for instruction of righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So every work and every deed that God ever intended or wants out of the believer, God ordains and dictates that it will come through the pages of the preserved scriptures. That's what God said. And we believe it. Revelation chapter 22, verse 18. Here is, here is, by inspiration of God, the very last book, in case there's any question in your mind now. John is the last apostle alive. Paul's dead. Peter's dead. Jude is dead. James is dead. They're all dead. Every one of them, except John. He's the last apostle alive. And Jesus comes to him, gives him seven letters to send to seven churches, and then he gives him the revelation, showing him the Antichrist, the last day, showing him the heavens, showing him the, the, uh, the lake of fire, showing him the tree of life in heaven, the temple of God, the new Jerusalem. God is showing John these things, and it's absolutely beautiful. And he writes all of them down. And then, then John testifies at the very, end, the very last verses of the whole Bible. Say this. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. 
If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly, amen, even so come Lord Jesus. And so John writes down, John himself writes down, and he says, number one, this book is done. It's complete. It's finished. You remember the Ten Commandments? They were written in stone on the front and the back. Do you know why? Because when God wrote them down, he said, number one, I'm writing on front and back of these tablets so that nobody can add to them. Same principle here is that nobody can add to, there, you can't have the Book of Mormon added to this. You can't have the prophecies of Kenneth Copeland where he said God told him that he could have died on the cross. You can't add those words to this book. They're not real. And then he said anybody who takes away from, see the Ten Commandments were written in stone. Why? Because you can't erase stone. Can't do it. Nobody can take away from the words of this book. And so, as of the, and then Jesus himself, Jesus himself pipes in and says, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. In other words, Jesus was saying, Amen. I approve that. And the very last words were given by John and Jesus. And at the very end of the book, they're saying, As of this point here, it's over with. It's done. It's complete. It's perfect for everything that you and I need to believe. And so we have the faithful transmission of every word of God that there is. Now, I'm going to put this up on the screen, okay? And um, take a look at it. This is like one of those early manuscripts, early copies uh, of the Bible. Now, I mentioned this before that if you know, like if you know of a grandmother or a grandfather, then you have their Bible and they were faithful to the Word of God. They didn't go to Bible college, they didn't learn Hebrew and Greek, but they just believed the words that were written in that old Bible that they had. And you know it is worn out and, and it's got news clippings in it. My grandmother saved news clippings and family momentum she shared, she put inside of that Bible old letters that she had. And a family Bible is usually a, a very sacred treasure to a family that loves one another. And we wouldn't dare even think of altering what we have. We want to try to take care of what we have. But you know as well as I do that the more a Bible is read, the more bi a Bible is used, the more a Bible is believed, there are probably, in my Bibles, tear stains. Because I have wept at times over the word of God and little tear drops from, from my eye and lands on the pages of the Bible. Uh, those paper doesn't deal well with humidity and tears and coffee. Doesn't deal well with that and so it kind of breaks it down over time. And that's what you have. You have, you know, from 2,000 years ago, you have these things being written down on papyrus or vellum. Let, let me... Let me tell you what that is. In fact, the, where, where we get the word paper from, this paper right here is a, we know it's a wood product. Where we get the word paper from is papyrus. Here's what they did. There was these long reeds. It was basically a, a form of grass is what it was, a big grass. And you know, even the grass that you have in your yard has like little layers to it. Well, they would take this papyrus reed and they would take it and they would splice it and they would have these really good layers. They would take them and they would weave them together Okay, like this and like this. They were all woven together and they would lay, flatten them out. They would kind of wet them down a little bit and then they would flatten them out and let them dry in the sun. And when they was all good and dry, then they had paper, papyrus. That's where the word paper comes from. They would have papyrus. And now they have something laid out here, big and long, that they can start writing on because ink goes very well with paper. And it's amazing that God designed it this way. So they write all this down, and then they take it very carefully, and they roll it up, okay? And they have that ready. The Bible refers to the roll of a book. And so even the word book in the Bible refers to a, like a scroll 
or collection of scrolls together. And so uh, the Apostle Paul used parchments, okay, is what he referred to. But then there was some that were written on what's called vellum, which was like animal skin, like lamb, like real soft or something like that, like leather. And it was processed a certain way, but anyway, they would take the skins of animals and then they would write down in ink these things on this vellum and the ink stuck to the leather, the animal skin, just like it did the papyrus. And you just can't lift the ink very, very easily off of these things. Now, over time, what happens is, is that this papyrus, it ends up looking like this. We'll put that back up on the screen. It ends up looking like that. And you can plainly see there down at the bottom that there's parts missing. It's kind of like it's kind of like buying a book and you're reading this really, really good book. It's like a whodunit. And at the very end of the book, it's going to tell you who the murderer was. You get to the end of the book and you find out that either the publisher didn't put that page in or somebody ripped it out. And you're going, I don't know what it says. I don't know what it says. So what do you do? Go get another copy. And you find out who did it. And so here's what happened. Okay, They took these things... And when they started getting wore out, they said, you know what, we need to copy this down. We need to memorialize this so that we can hand this down to future generations. Just like God said, just like he said, he said, write it down so to be for a memorial forever and forever. Now, as I mentioned before, if let's say that this was the original that Paul wrote something down on. We don't have this. Probably for this reason, it just got destroyed with use, okay? So what we have is copies. Now, you have to ask yourself the question, did God ever preserve his word past these originals? Did God preserve every word? Well, I believe that he did, according to the scriptures. Well, let me show you something here. Remember that this was grass, papyrus, or vellum, animal skins. Let me show you what God intended with these things right here. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 6. The voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. Stop right here. All flesh, animals, is grass, papyrus. Those were the two things that these things were written down on. All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Let me just make this very plain for you. God knew. God knew that when they wrote down on here, that eventually this original would vanish away. God even knew that what he spoke to Jeremiah, eventually when Jeremiah was dead, if Jeremiah did nothing but receive the words of God and did write them down, they would have died with Jeremiah. God knew also that if all God wanted for man was this original parchment here, God surely knew, because he said this, that grass and flesh, animal skin, passes away. It fades away. It doesn't last. And God knew that. So, But he says here, that, but the word of our God shall stand forever. So while God anticipated that these originals were going to crumple into pieces and not ever be seen again, God had always intended, it was not just some afterthought made up by King James only people. It is the very word of God that said, I will preserve my words and they will stand forever, even if the paper that they're written on doesn't exist anymore. God said that he would preserve his word. That's what he said. And I believe that he has. Past this, I believe what he said. Look at First Peter chapter one verse twenty-four. For all flesh is Peter's quoting. Peter is quoting Isaiah, and he said, "For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. 
but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. You know what Peter's saying? Peter's saying that God not only preserved his word past the ability of this piece of grass to maintain it, but it's the very same word that produces the gospel that's preached unto, uh, unto you. Who's Peter writing to? Well, he was writing to the people of his day, but we know and believe that he was writing to us today. For this generation forever is what the Bible says. And so he's saying here, he's quoting the same verse, and he understands that these little pieces of paper vanish away. But the gospel is going to be, what is it we believe according to Matthew chapter 24? The gospel of this kingdom is going to be preached to the entire world, and then shall the end come. So it was God's idea. Jesus himself knew that his word would exist and the gospel would be preached based upon that word, not just from the original manuscripts. Let me give you another verse of scripture. And I just kind of thought of this. Remember what Paul said to Timothy? Now, you have to understand that what Paul and Timothy had of the Old Testament was not original manuscripts. They didn't have those originals. You know what they had? Copies. They had copies of the originals. And you know what Paul said to Timothy? He said that from a child, thou hast known the holy scriptures. Timothy knew them since he was a child. He knew what the Bible said. And Paul called them holy scriptures. That's because Paul believed that from the Old Testament, God had faithfully preserved his words, even past the grasses or the vellums, the flesh's ability to hold on to it. God had faithfully transmitted his word through copies to the day when Timothy, a little boy, was hearing the gospel preached and he believed it. He knew the Holy Scriptures. Now, does corruption show up? In the Bible. Does, does the devil hate the Bible? <laughs> he hates it. He absolutely hates the Bible. So here we have the devil showing up. As soon as God now first speaks to man, we have the devil showing up. So first we have God speaking his law to Adam. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, And the Lord God commanded, there's God's commandments, the man saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, this was God's commandment to Adam concerning sin, concerning the law, this tree. Adam, here's, here's one law. All you have to do is keep one commandment. This is all you have to do is just obey one rule. Isn't that interesting? That all Adam had to do was just keep this one rule. He didn't have 600 some odd laws. He just had one. He said, that, see that tree? Don't eat it. You can sit by it, you can weed eat around it, you can throw the fruit at Eve if you want to. You just can't eat it. You cannot eat it. And what do we see happening? That was the oral command of God to Adam. God, of course, did not write it down then. Moses did later. God gave the oral command to Adam. And it was Adam's responsibility to faithfully transmit his word to Eve, somehow, some way, because it wasn't written down, something got lost. Because we know that when the devil showed up to Eve, he said, now the devil shows up, Genesis 3, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now the devil immediately is casting doubt on whether or not God said this. And have you, have you not heard that from pulpits? Have you not heard that in Bible college? We are the critics of the Bible. It is our job to question whether or not God really said these words or not. I've heard that before. Doesn't sound right to me anymore, does it? Because that's the first thing the devil did. Yea, God, did God really say this? How can you know that God said this? Is it written down anywhere? You shall not eat every tree of the garden. Now, if it had been written down, he could have said, well, it says right here, um, thou, the, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And God said, you know, we can't eat of this tree. And then he says in verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Now we'll stop right here. He is directly contradicting, giving the exact opposite 
of the words of God. He is, God said, ye shall surely die. Lucifer said, the serpent said, just add one word, not. Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And Eve had already said, God said we can't eat of it, neither can we touch it. You see, here we have the devil taking away from it, but we have because what is in the wicked nature of man, we add to it. We like to take what God said and say, now God said this, now I'm going to tell you what, what I think you ought to do. And we always add to things from the word of God. That's because we have a wicked heart. And Eve already is going, ah, oh, God said we can't even touch it. But God never said that. He never said that. And sin and death, was introduced into the world because of one thing, adding to or taking away from the words of God. Both Eve and the devil together were complicit in corrupting the original word of God. And they both face the wrath of God as a result of it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, here's what the Apostle Paul says of this very event. He said, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted. There's that word corrupted. From the simplicity that is in Christ. In other words, go back and follow the method of, of Satan in the Garden of Eden. Go back and find out what happened. Because just the way the serpent beguiled Eve is the same way that your mind would be corrupted. Why? How? By adding to or taking away from the very words that God said. And so we know that corruption took place all the way back. As soon as the commandment came out of God's mouth to Adam, here comes the devil. He, God creates Eve. Now here comes the serpent going after the weaker vessel, and he's corrupting God's word. And Paul's saying, right here, right now, there's people out there still corrupting the word of God. Notice in Jeremiah chapter 36, verse 22. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month. This is Jehoiakim. And there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. And it came to pass that when Jehudi had read three or four leaves, he cut it with a penknife, cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. You see, man hates, wicked man hates these words. Hate them. And so they brought what Jeremiah had Barak describe right down. And Jehoiakim, as soon as they were read to him, he said, let me have those. Cuts them all up, throws them into the fire, and they're burned and destroyed. And he's going, ah, now there's no more word of God. Really? Jeremiah chapter 36, verse 32. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Barak, the scribe, the son of Uriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and there were added besides unto them many like words. Do you know what God was doing? Preserving it. Even past the originals, because the originals are gone now. And God preserved his words. Just because Jehoiakim, just because the devil, just because the scholars don't like certain parts of the Bible and they take them out, God's still going to preserve his word. That's what he said. It's what he promised. Past the originals. Acts chapter 13, verse 9. Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. He's referring to a guy by the name of Bar-Jesus, who was a false prophet. And he said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And so here is Paul trying to preach the gospel to a man by the name of Sergius Paulus who wanted to hear the truth. And here we have a false prophet who does not want him to hear the truth, doesn't want him to hear the word of God. And so he seeks he sees to pervert the right ways of God. He's saying, if this guy hears this, I won't have power over him anymore. And you need to understand the wicked nature of man loves to have power over other men. They get off on that. Some people like money. Some people like women. Some people like having power over everybody. And in order to do that, they have to pervert the right ways and the words of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. For we are not as many 
which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, and in the sight of God speak we in Christ. Paul was saying that in his day, there were already people perverting the words of God. They were corrupting them. They were taking the words, the letters that were being sent back and forth from the churches and the gospels and the Old Testament. They were taking them and corrupting them, taking stuff out, making sure that nobody read what these men wrote down. And so here we have, while New Testament believers were busy copying these words and passing them around to one another, there were people already corrupting the words of God. We see it in the book of Genesis. The devil was doing it. Kings have done it. They hate the word of God. And then we have people in the days of the early church who hated the words of the apostle Paul. They hated the words of John. They hated the gospel. Fiercely they hated it because it didn't match their presupposed ideas. It didn't match their mystery religions. And so they said, we've got to corrupt the word of God. And so already there were, there were other gospels being written, like the gospel of Thomas, the gospel of Mary Magdalene. Things that Mary Magdalene never wrote down, they were writing them down. And they were saying, this is a gospel too. And so we have what they call these lost books of the Bible. They really don't belong there because Mary didn't write it, Thomas didn't write it, Peter didn't write the gospel but they want to make you think they did. So they put Peter's name on it and they start corrupting either by adding to or corrupting by taking away. Copies were being made that when the scribe was going, you know, this says Jesus uh, came in the flesh, God came in the flesh. Um, I don't agree with that. I think Paul was wrong. I'm just going to change that a little bit. So he made a corrupted copy deliberately deliberately corrupted the words of God because he had an evil heart. He hated, hated Jesus, hated God. So he deliberately corrupted the word of God. Now, I'm going to show you this. I'm going to show you this up on the screen. Okay, You need to understand. In the Garden of Eden, there was the tree of life, and then there was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And they were both in the midst of Isn't that interesting? They were both in the midst of the garden. And God gave Adam free will. He gave him choice. He said, Adam, you can choose now. Whichever, whichever one you want, the choice is yours. Remember when they stood Jesus up in, in front of the Israelites and they had Jesus and they had Barabbas. They got Barabbas, dirty, smelly, nasty looking Barabbas who was a murderer and a thief and everything else. And they stood him there and they stood the Holy One of God here. Here is Jesus, the Holy One of God, the Word of God himself. And they stood up the murderer and they said, choose. And isn't it interesting that practically everybody chose the bad one. Adam chose the bad one. And so it really is a choice. God offers you a choice to make. And so we have the pure vine of Christ, which is the word of God, the pure vine. We're looking at how we got our Bible. And then we have the corrupt vine of Sodom. And I call it that for a reason. I'll show you why in a minute. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And so here Peter is saying there is an incorruptible seed that comes from an incorrupted vine and a corruptible seed that comes from a corrupted vine, the vine of Sodom. Eve believed the corrupted version. So did Israel in choosing the murderer over the Holy One of God. They chose the corrupt one. A lot of people choosing the wrong vine. They are. Let me show you this in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 31. The Bible says, For their rock is not as our rock. Notice there's two rocks. Even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine then is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Is, the, is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? You know what God's saying here? He's saying there is a real vine and then there is a corrupt vine. It's the vine of Sodom. Now I want you to think of what fruit then would come out of the vine of Sodom? What fruit would be produced as a result of that? 
And so it's corrupt. He said, their grapes are bitter, their gall, then their wine is the poison of dragon, the venom of asps, the serpent. The serpent poisoned Eve with his words. He poisoned her by corrupting the word of God. A corrupted form of the Bible went into Eve and poisoned her and she died. And he says, is not, is not this laid up in store with me, sealed up among my treasures? You know what God means by that? He said, in, in my word, in my word, I'm going to show you the difference. How you can spot the vine of Sodom, how you can know which is the vine of Sodom, and the real words of God. God is saying to you, I'm going to show you how you can know between the truth and the lie. Now, in our next study, we're going to continue this. In our next study, we're going to go through and we're going to find out how we can know the true vine from the vine of Sodom. I want you to think of this. Think of what Jesus said. He said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me bringeth forth much fruit. But we already know that the vine of Sodom has poison in it. And so this really is where we're going. I have all of my former friends here because I was Bible college trained. I can read Greek. Oimen oin dias parentes. I can still read it. Apotes. Telepsios, I can still read it. Don't know what it says. Can you read this? Probably not. And I'm not saying I'm better than you because I really, I know I'm not. But I was trained that this is the real Bible and that all of these Bibles, and they, they even admit now, they even admit that this has errors in it. They even admit it. This, oh yes, we, we, do, we, don't think we, we don't think we have it all. We don't think we have everything. They admit that. And that all of these Bibles now, the Living Bible, the book, the New King James, the NIV, all these other translations, um, they say, I used to believe that these were not really the Word of God. Oh, it contains parts of the Word of God, but some of them we don't have anymore. I used to believe that. That poisoned me. And it produced some really, really bad fruit in my life. This, however, I take and believe as the truth. It has done nothing but good for me. Nothing but good for me. And so I'm going to show you in the next segment of this, how you can know the difference between the true vine and the fake one. Let me, let me illustrate this way. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. We know that from scripture. We also know from scripture to be sober, be vigilant for your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Two lions. How do we know the truth? Two vines. How do we know? Two ways that we get our Bible. I'm going to show you that. How can we know what the truth is? I will show you that from the Bible. How we can know. How we got this Bible versus how we got these. If you were told that, well, these are just updating the language, that's not true. That's not all they did. They decided to go away from the traditional line to an entirely different one. And I'll show you that in the next segment of this. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. Pray about what you hear from me because both you and I are going to have to stand before God one of these days and give an account of the decisions that we're making right now. And I take that seriously. So what I say to you, I say in love. And I want you to know what I've found. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. God bless you.